Abul Qasim al Zarawi, born in 936 and died in 1013. After the Umayyad ruled, were ousted from the power by the Abbasids in 750. Prince Abdurrahman ibn Muawiyah fled Damascus and arrived in North Africa. From there he reached Cordova, the capital of Andalus, Muslim Spain, in 756 and swiftly assumed control of that country. Abdurrahman's unexpected rise to power in Islamic Spain assured the continuation of Umayyad rule in the Islamic West for almost another 300 years. And by unifying Spain under his able leadership, he also inaugurated one of the most memorable periods in European history. Under the guidance of his descendants such as Abdurrahman II and Muhammad I, Spain became one of the most advanced European nations of the time. During the reign of Abdurrahman III and Hakam II, the fortune of Islamic Spain increased so rapidly that Cordova became Europe's most impressive capital thanks to their generous patronage of learning and higher education. Khalif Abdurrahman III and his successors turned Cordova into a thriving centre of intellectual, cultural and literary activities and as a result scholars, scientists, mathematicians, philosophers and theologians flocked from across Europe to the leading Spanish cities in order to learn, to study and to master the finer points of their chosen pursuits under the tutelage of Europe's great minds. At the time, some of Europe's leading scientists, intellectuals and writers happened to be Muslims who flourished in Spain under the generous patronage of the Umayyad rulers. Al-Zarawi was one such outstanding scholar and scientist whose contribution and achievements in the field of medicine and surgery was unique and unprecedented. Abul Qasim Khalaf ibn Abbas al-Zarawi, known in medieval Europe as al Bukasis, was born in the royal suburbs of Al-Zara in Cordova during the glorious reign of Khalif Abdurrahman III. Born and raised at a time when Islamic Spain was at its intellectual zenith, Al-Zarawi grew up to be a prodigiously talented child who excelled in his studies and thanks to Khalif Abdurrahman III's long and wise reign, political stability was restored across Muslim Spain and material prosperity spread throughout the country like never before. This encouraged both Muslims and non-Muslim scholars and scientists to collaborate and to make some of medieval Europe's finest scientific and literary contributions, complementing the great cultural and architectural achievements of the time. After completing his early education in Arabic and aspects of Islamic physical sciences, Al-Zarawi developed a keen interest in the medical sciences, and thus he received advanced training in medicine at Cordova under the guidance of its leading Muslim physicians and rapidly acquired something of a reputation for his skills as a medical practitioner. It was during this period that Khalif Abdurrahman III came to hear about the young physician, and accordingly he invited al-Zarawi to the Khalifal court. Although he was barely in his mid-twenties at the time, the Khalif was deeply impressed by al-Zarawi's profound knowledge and understanding of medicine, and asked him to become his personal physician. He went on to serve the Khalif in the capacity of personal physician until the latter died in 961 at the age of 71, having ruled Islamic Spain for no less than half a century. As a physician, al-Zarawi was a proud inheritor of traditional Islamic medicine. If ancient Greek physicians like Hippocrates, Galen, Discorides and Paul of Agina were highly skilled medical practitioners who contributed immensely to the development of science, then gifted Muslim physicians like Al-Kindi, Ali ibn Rabban al-Tabari and Abu Bakr al-Razi 
were the first to study and integrate ancient Greek medical thought into the Islamic worldview and thereby produce a powerful and an authoritative medical synthesis which influenced the study and practice of medicine up to the modern period. And although it is true that the Greeks considered medicine to be yet another scientific discipline like astronomy and cosmology, the early Muslim scientists and physicians refused to compartmentalise science and instead they develop an integrated and holistic approach based on the fundamental principles and practice of Islam. That's to say, influenced by the principle of Tib al-Nabi, the prophetic medicine, the early Muslim physicians formulated an essentially Islamic approach to medical science, which sought to remedy the physical ailments, but to do so without overlooking the emotional and spiritual dimension of man. And this explains why they went out of their way to organise the healthcare programme in accordance with all the all-encompassing Islamic approach to life, health and well-being. Following in their footsteps, Al-Zarawi also studied and practised medicine from a holistic perspective. Unlike his illustrious predecessors, he believed that diseases and ailments were best treated in the wider context rather than in isolation. Al-Zarawi was barely 25 when Al-Hakan ascended the throne in Cordova and asked him to serve as his personal physician. Like his father, al Hakam was a wise, peaceful and benevolent ruler who became renowned for his love and of learning and scholarship. And to this end, he promoted learning and education across Muslim Spain and transformed the Academy of Cordova into one of the largest institutions of higher education in Europe at the time. Likewise, the libraries of Cordova were packed with books and manuscripts on all the scientists of that day. The Caliph also recruited some of the brightest minds of the time to his institutions of higher education and thereby blazed a trail which continued to burn across Europe for centuries. Such was al Hakam's enthusiasm for learning and scholarship that the historians have compared him with the Abbasid Khalif Abdullah al Ma'mun, who was also a formidable champion of higher education and learning. As the Khalif's personal physician, Al Zarawi had full access to his private library, which contains some of the best medical textbooks of the day, and this enabled him to devote all his spare time and energy to advanced study and research into all aspects of medicine. Although there were many other outstanding Muslim scientists, most notably, Abu Qasim Maslama al Majriti, Abu Yusuf ibn Ishaq ibn Shabrut, and Arib ibn Saad al Qatib al Qurtubi, who lived and practiced medicine in Cordova at the time. It was al Zarawi who was destined to carry out groundbreaking research in medicine and develop scores of new surgical tools and techniques for the benefit of future generations. During the course of his medical career, Al-Zarawi pursued theoretical research, but also carried out practical experiments in order to demonstrate or verify his theories at a practical level. As a pioneer of surgical anatomy, he performed a large number of operations, ranging from simple cesarean sections to more complex and delicate eye operations. He performed such complex and often critical surgical operations at the time when there was no suitable medical tool or equipment to assist him. This prompted him to devise and develop the surgical equipments which would enable him to perform medical operations with success. And in so doing, he laid the foundation for the modern science of surgery. No doubt, the reluctance of the early Muslim physicians to carry out surgical operations hindered the development of clinical anatomy in the Muslim world until the pioneering Al-Zarawi took the initiative and invented the surgical tools necessary for performing operations. He not only invented a large number of surgical tools, but also performed numerous operations using the same tools and equipment, and thus paving the way for the emergence of surgical procedures and techniques as we know them today. Moreover, as an accomplished practitioner 
of cauterization. That's the practice of searing a wound by burning it with a hot iron to destroy the infection. Al-Zarawi was able to utilize this technique to treat other medical conditions such as hemorrhoids, malignant tumors and excessive bleeding. The medieval Muslim physicians preferred this method because traditional Islamic teachings justified it as a legitimate practice. Not surprisingly, Al-Zarawi recommended it for the treatment of apoplexy, epilepsy, bone fractures and dislocations as well as various other surgical disorders. As a practicing Muslim, he understood and appreciated why women preferred to be operated on by women rather than men. So he used to train midwives to carry out emergency cesarean operations and other clinical procedures on women. If an operation turned out to be more difficult than anticipated, he provided guidance and instructions to the midwives from behind a screen. In short, it had not been for al-Zarawi the Muslim contribution to the development of the science of surgery will not have been worth mentioning. After a lifetime devoted to medical research and surgery, al-Zarawi eventually decided to write a book on the subject. At the time, as al-Zarawi was busy writing his book, Ibn Sina, the renowned Muslim physician and philosopher, was also in the process of writing his famous Al-Qanun fi al-Tib, the canon of medicine, which subsequently became one of the most popular medical encyclopedias of all time. Like Ibn Sina's canon, Al-Zarawi's monumental kitab Al-Tasrif Liman Ijaz, an ill talif, an aid to him who lacks the capacity to read large books, played a pivotal role in the development of modern medicine and surgical procedures and techniques consisting of 30 chapters. This book was in fact a massive encyclopedia of, on medicine and surgery and soon after its publication, it became one of the most sought after surgical textbook of its time. After providing a detailed and systematic explanation of cauterization and how this medical procedure is to be carried out, Al-Zarawi explained how surgical operations including ocular and dental surgery should be performed using a scalpel. In addition to this, he covered aspects of obstetrics and explained how gallstones should be removed among many other topics. He was of the opinion that a decaying tooth should be removed and in certain circumstances how it can be replaced with artificial tooth or one extracted from animals. As an accomplished dentist, he was thoroughly familiar with all aspects of oral hygiene and dentistry. In the last part of his Tasrif, he provided a detailed explanation of bone fractures and dislocations. He argued that fractures and dislocations could be treated successfully without having to operate on them. And for the first time in medical history, he correctly diagnosed that paralysis resulted from the fracture of the spine. He then explained all aspects of gynaecology, including childbirth, and also identified what is today widely known as culture's position. Most significantly, al zarawis book contained illustrations of around 200 different surgical tools and equipment, most of which he had invented himself. And all the illustrations were accompanied by brief but precise explanation of each tool, its meaning and purpose. The surgical part of his book became so popular in Europe that it was first translated into Latin by Gerard of Sermona and published in Venice in 1497 and thereafter it was published in Strasbourg in 1532 and Oxford in 1778. This book was rated so highly by the Europeans that it was prescribed to all medical students at Europe's leading universities until as late as the 18th century. The famous French surgeon, Guy de Cholic, Cholic, Choliac, Guy de Choliac, I'm not going to be French, considered it to be such an important textbook on surgery that he included it in one of his own works. Although Al-Zarawi became famous in the West as the father of surgery, 
His work did not receive similar recognition in the Islamic East, perhaps because surgery was never a popular branch of medicine in the Muslim world. But nevertheless, al-Zarawi was an unusually gifted physician who contributed more to the development of surgery and surgical tools and procedures than any other single individual in the history of medicine. He died at the age of 77 and was buried in his native Cordova.